Good afternoon, everyone. Um, you're very welcome to this Ashray Ireland technical webinar. My name is Daniel Coakley, and I'll be chairing today's session. So uh, before we begin, I'm just going to, to um, give a short introduction and, and cover some housekeeping and general information before handing over to today's speaker, uh, Dr. Drew Crawley. Uh, afterwards, after Drew's presentation, we should have around uh, 10 to 15 minutes for questions and answers from the audience, and I'll finish off with some closing announcements. Um, so before we begin, I just want to highlight a couple of points regarding participation in today's webinar. So all attendees are muted, but if you would like to ask a question, please use the questions tab or the chat function to submit your query, and we'll do our best to answer it during the seminar. Um, you can submit questions at any time. If you have any difficulty or want to follow up afterwards, the email contact details have been provided. Um, I believe Drew is, is happy to send a copy of today's uh, presentation after the, after the seminar, so that will be emailed out to attendees. Um, you can also access a copy of my, my presentation, uh, this presentation in the handouts tab. Uh, and lastly, when the seminar is finished, you'll uh, receive a short survey, three questions, which we'd really appreciate your response on. Um, so most of our events over the last uh, year or so at this stage have, have focused around COVID-19 and how to mitigate the spread of airborne infection in buildings. Um, I'm glad to say today's presentation is a, is a bit of a departure from um, the, the, the topics uh, around COVID. Uh, but if you are interested or you've missed any of those previous events, uh, you can view them on the link on this slide or on our YouTube channel. Um, so we've already had a couple of webinars since the start of this year and we'll be adding more over the coming weeks. Uh, all of these are free to attend and you can register using the links provided on the slide or view the recordings again on our YouTube channel. Uh, just a reminder as well, in addition to the, these local chapter events, the Ashray Learning Institute continues to run a range of courses uh, which are available at the link uh, on this slide. There's also HVAC design and operation training level one and two available virtually and there are plans to offer additional training um, especially for the European region uh, later this year. So now I'm going to hand over to today's speaker, uh, Drew Crawley, for today's presentation entitled Big, Smart and Everything, Data, Technology, Buildings, Cities and the Internet of Things. Drew Crawley is a Bentley Fellow and Director of Building Performance Research, focusing on building performance, uh, building information modelling, sustainability, resilience and smart cities. Prior to being elevated to Bentley Fellow in 2014, he held development or he led development sorry, of Bentley suite of building performance software for four years. And before joining Bentley in 2010, Dr. Crawley developed and managed Energy Plus at the US uh, Department of Energy's Commercial Buildings Initiative, promoting creation of net zero energy buildings. He was also current director at large at ASHRAE and vice president of FIBSA. So um, over to you, Drew. I'll just make you presenter now. I'm going to share, share my webcam so you can see my messy office and, and uh, uh, for the rest of it I'll, uh, so you won't be distracted by dogs. I'm going to turn that off. But, uh, thank you very much, Daniel, and, and thank you uh, to the Ireland chapter for inviting me. Um, I hope to do it in person. I always love coming to Dublin. Um, and it's uh, been too long and I, I'm sure like a number of people, I'm really looking forward to traveling again. So today uh, is really kind of a, a quick overview. I'm sure some of those of you in the audience have uh, better knowledge on, on many of the topics I'm going to talk about, but I'm trying to give a broad brush looking at some of the things that are affecting our industry that are going to make radical change in what's going on over the next uh, few decades. Uh, data is um, the new gold, I guess, for, for many things, being able to mine that. Technology is changing very rapidly. I'm not gonna focus very much on, on what those changes are, just giving examples. 
uh, how our buildings are changing, our cities, and then Internet of Things, and how all that kind of comes together. <clears throat> okay, so uh, this is registered through ASHRAE with the American Institute of Architects for uh, learning units, as well as uh, uh, GBCI for uh, credits there, if that's if that's useful to you. Um, we're going to start off. I'm going to uh, start today by looking at uh, data analytics, uh, how it might apply to buildings, how it's already being used in other industries, particularly industry. Um, look uh, quickly at SMART, what it means, how it might impact buildings. Um, look at the Internet of Things, what's uh, driving that, what's going to be possible, and then how that's going to be uh, influencing our cities uh, moving forward. Um, and really the, the challenge and, and goals that many cities are already uh, are taking on, so it'll be interesting. <clears throat> I always like to start my talks. Uh, I'm a buildings guy, buildings energy guy, so I'd like to, to lead off with why do we even care about building energy use? And worldwide in our economy, the, the bottom two bars there, uh, the blue and the green are uh, commercial and residential buildings. And worldwide, we're looking about 30% of, of energy use and more than that for emissions, partly because the emissions are uh, related to electricity use. <clears throat> and globally, about half of the energy use is related to industry. But if you move to the third and fourth bars, uh, China and Hong Kong, you see kind of two different extremes of how that, that's working. In China, the energy use is up uh, to almost 20% for buildings. Uh, when I started putting these uh, together a decade or, or two back, uh, China was down about 10% for buildings. So the energy use in their building sector has doubled in that period. Uh, industry, of course, dominates as 70%. If you look at the Hong Kong right next to it, buildings are 65%. Well, you would know that looking at any picture of Hong Kong. It's very much a very dense, urban, very small uh, place, and industries of much uh, smaller uh, proportion of their economy. If you go over a few more, you'll see Europe, about 40% of buildings in general, and still 35% uh, or so in, uh, in industry. And transportation, you know, varies kind of depending on the transportation. Uh, in the U.S., which is the far right, we have uh, about 40% of our buildings uh, are now um, are, are energy use. And interesting changes happened in, in some of the data. I'm actually looking forward to seeing some of the 2020 data because uh, we should see a, a, a large drop in transportation and somewhat of a drop in industry, but residential should be growing. Uh, so, and I'm seeing some of those early uh, data trends there. But if we <clears throat> go on, uh, a decade ago, it looked like our uh, commercial sector or non-residential sector was going to overtake um, the residential. And then the recession of about a decade ago really changed that. We still have a number of, of uh, commercial buildings that are empty. And recently, uh, with the downturn, the commercial energy activity is, is uh, uh, much lower. Uh, transportation actually dropped uh, some in this period as well. This is based on uh, 2020 data uh, projections of that. So that normally was about a third of energy use and in industry as proportion grew. But one of the things I wanna uh, to, uh, discuss and why it, this, um, let me back up. I wanna show you and explain why it's important to understand where all the energy flows are in our buildings. In our residential uh, buildings in the US, about a third of the energy is for heating, uh, another 13% or so for water heating, 11% for cooling, and then the appliances uh, in our life. But that even includes computers today. Uh, but even the lighting and the televisions have gotten much more efficient over the last decade. But what's really important is the bottom bar. It's the other uses. It's all the small devices that have crept into our houses over the last two decades. Uh, I have 21-year-old uh, twins, uh, both at university um, and doing well, and they are, uh, but when they're home, uh, I have a 
app that I can check uh, how my uh, Wi-Fi router is doing. And when they're home, my, the device count on my Wi-Fi router goes up over 20 devices. Because you think about it, uh, you've got the computers on there, you have the phones, you have tablets, games, even the TVs and other devices are attached to it. So a lot of small energy uses have crept in. Yes, we can take a look at um, the the big ones and worry about the heating and, and uh, water heating, cooling, refrigeration, et cetera. But it's all the small devices we need to think about as well. And that so that's very important. If we're going to really make an impact and uh, reduce energy use in our buildings, we've got to attack all of those issues. On the uh, non-residential side, uh, it looks uh, pretty similar, heating, refrigeration, and you wonder why refrigeration so high. Well, refrigeration includes all of our grocery stores and, and other food storage areas. So if you're in a grocery store, this chart would be meaningless because refrigeration would account for over half of the energy use. So lighting and cooling, heating are, are kind of in the noise for that, and you really need to focus on the refrigeration. And there are new technologies doing that. But then you look at others. Uh, lighting used to be uh, very dominant in the U.S., but just in the last five years, I've seen the percentage of it drop uh, pretty fast as LEDs are making very quick inroads into energy use. Office equipment computing still up over uh, or almost 13% in total. So a lot of the small equipment uh, is still dominating, but computers have been getting more efficient. But like residential, we have almost a third of the energy use that are in the small uh, devices and, and in here. So we need to consider the whole range of things that we've uh, been covering <clears throat> to make sure that we do that. Some of the trends I've been seeing, uh, uh, about uh, 20 years ago, I was able to step back and try to look at the industry as a whole when I was at the Department of Energy and look at what was happening. And one of the interesting things was on centralization of ownership. We had, instead of all the buildings, at, and, and still in the US, um, the federal government's one of the largest building holders in the US, but at second, uh, place is uh, Walmart, our, our largest retailer, and Walmart has about 1% of, of the building floor space. So you see that there has been kind of a centralization. It used to be that uh, people own one or two or maybe a, a, a small set of buildings, but now we're seeing that uh, owners and managers are operating um, large um, retail chains or they're operating many office buildings across cities or even across the country and the world. Um, we've seen interest in climate change mitigation. That has been a 180 degree turn, of course, with the new administration. I'm still, given our current Congress, I don't think we're going to see anything about carbon regulation. There's a push again to uh, put a price on carbon, but the prices vary so widely, I'm not sure that we're going to get any uh, easy solution to that uh, near term. Uh, got sort of political deadlock on uh, in the capital. Um, of course, continuing interest in green, sustainable, and living buildings, BIM, digital modeling, and I'll even add digital twin to that. Uh, one of the more exciting things has been, for me, has been the availability of data. Uh, Knowing what's going on in the building stock has been very difficult. Being able to look at what's happening in the past in the U.S., we've had our we've had a commercial building survey, uh, but even that only had 5,000 buildings in it, in which a very small percentage of, of what's going on. And now, <clears throat> uh, 25 of the largest U.S. cities are are collecting uh, data for that and and be, uh, to be able to. Um, and share that, and those are public data sets are available. And I'll, I'll show you a little bit of uh, how one of those uh, is can be applied. Net zero energy buildings, net zero carbon, um, and ASHRAE has just recently, in the last two months, established a decarbonization, a building decarbonization task force, and that is really focused on how can we get decarbonization as a central theme throughout ASHRAE, throughout our standards, throughout our publications and other things, and really make sure that ASHRAE is on the forefront of that. So you'll definitely be hearing more about that as we go forward. Uh, of course, with uh, the 
increased incidence of uh, weather events and uh, adverse weather events and other things. There's been interest in resilience. Uh, I saw recently uh, an article about how uh, the city of Miami would need to spend four billion dollars to be able to deal with the uh, rise in sea level that's expected in the next 15 years. That's 10 times their annual budget just to deal with that. So they have a real issue there. And then of course, the hype, and I'll, I'll go ahead and admit that, about uh, internet of things and smart everything. There's uh, uh, a lot of things being sold out there or being attempted to be sold um, that uh, are not quite there, but we'll talk about uh, more about that. As far as energy use, um, the flagship ASHRAE standard 90.1 for non-residential buildings has been increasingly uh, improving. The uh, standard started back in the, the mid 70s in response to the uh, oil crisis and has been getting better over time. But you see toward the right, 2013, 16, and 19, the last three versions, we've been seeing single digits and even the uh, three, 4.3% uh, projected for the latest version of 90.1 is quite small. I think we're getting to the point where technology, there's not much more that we could do in, in this. And uh, there, the technology is just not there to, to push that anymore. So it's really getting down to more performance rather than the fixed asset. At the same time, ASHRAE's green building standard for uh, same type of buildings, 189.1, has been staying a bit ahead of that. Uh, I don't have any estimates. The 189.1 2020 just came out late last year. It's also, it's sold as that overseas, but in the US it's sold as part of the International Green Construction Code or the IGCC. So I expect that same sort of uh, small decrease in energy use. Um, technology is accelerating. If you go to the far left and look, the telephone started, of course, before 1900, but it took all the way to 1975 before 90% uh, of US households had a phone, which may seem rather surprising. But if you go to the other extreme and, and look at the, uh, the last dotted line there, the cell phone, uh, not a lot of penetration very early, but by 2005, 15 years ago, 90% of uh, people in the U.S. had cell phones. Uh, landline ownership in the U.S. continues to drop. Many people will probably, I, I know my kids likely will never have a landline, uh, and many people are just dropping it because of the convenience of always having their phone with them. Same is true, the computers, the internet, we're seeing all of this, this curve instead of being very flat, has gotten very steep. And that's true as we get new technology through here. Uh, I love this little um, video. I wish I could find a better version of it, but just shows you the idea that everything that was on our desktop, that was our office, now fits within the confines of our, our computer. But even at this point, that same power is on our uh, mobile phones today, to, that you have the capability that, uh, that was you know, unthinkable just a few years ago. My, my cell phone is a lot more powerful than a laptop that I had 15 years ago. The other thing that's happening is, this is a great chart that uh, gets updated annually, uh, kind of as an advertising piece, but it shows you kind of the uh, variety of what's going on out there. And let me pick some things. LinkedIn, uh, 70,000 jobs applied for a minute on LinkedIn. Uh, Facebook users share 150,000 uh, messages a minute. Uh, I like the one uh, center right, consumers spend $1 million a minute online. Uh, YouTube users upload 500 hours of video. So we're seeing a lot of activity going on. And if you try to go around this chart and see which of these were even around uh, 10 years ago or even five years ago, many of them were not. I mean, top left is Zoom, 208,000 participants in meetings. Uh, Zoom hasn't been around that long. So there is a, a huge transactional change going on in the digital world. It's enabling things that we weren't able to do uh, in the past. The other thing that uh, I'm seeing increasingly is the idea that we can do additive um, 
manufacturing or 3D printing. And for a while, I saw things that were kind of desktop scale at best like this. But then I began to see activities where 3D uh, buildings are printed. Uh, I saw an article about a, uh, um, a village that was being 3D printed in Eindhoven, Netherlands. And so that capability of building scale to be able to do that in very quickly and printing concrete. And so interesting things, here was a kind of a, a 3D printed uh, quick to assemble uh, test that was done for Department of Energy uh, five or six years ago. There are 3D printed buildings in the Middle East. Uh, the, these are in France. It was more of a 3D uh, a test case of what could be done within a, a system showing that rather than a, a building itself. <clears throat> but then I started to see things where the form now no longer is dictated by the materials we have, that we can 3D print everything. And that was kind of uh, the interesting thing. And this, which is a, a, a metal joint, um, a structural joint that uh, was 3D printed and used in a project by ERA. And so if we're at the point where we're 3D printing metal and it's structurally solid enough to be able to handle it, it expresses the forces in there and, and where the, the strength needs to be, uh, that we are now uh, getting the possibility where we can 3D print everything. A lot of possibilities there, never there before. Uh, we have the capability of doing 2D, 3D, uh, PDF, BIM to SIM. This is a, a paper I found on the internet a number of years ago. I was more interested in the, um, the little floor plans there, but being able to bring in the floor plan, trace on top of it, and create my energy model uh, is very easy to do now. And, uh, things that wouldn't be possible for. It's still, um, I think, the vision of many to be able to use our designs directly within uh, energy simulation, but it's still kind of a challenge for a lot of things. This is another uh, case where uh, a building was 3D, um, was actually a 1960s uh, high school in, New, um, in Australia, and they were looking to see if they could do airflow uh, through there without having to put um, and do natural ventilation rather than adding in uh, air conditioning. But that was directly exported from the, uh, the, the BIM model. They digitized all their buildings uh, back a few years ago. So that's possible. But even now it's gotten to the point where you can take a picture of a, um, a sketch on a piece of paper and bring it in and then create a model very quickly. So that change has, has been interesting to watch. Um, also, we're seeing effects of urbanization, you know, the interest in decarbonization, I don't think we're really there, but also digitalization, that we, a digital is a, a good means of uh, preserving information and, and uh, making sure we can take it forward. But if you look at the global patterns, um, and we, we had our large cities in 1995, but 20 years later, major cities have emerged around the world. Uh, many of them in Asia, uh, of course, uh, London and, and Paris uh, being two of those as well, but also South America and Central America. And so that continued uh, urbanization it has seemed to continue even today. Decarbonization, uh, in this report from the United Nations, they, uh, the temperature increase in heat waves, the, that's seen as the largest uh, risk for many cities that uh, sea level yes but an additional um, risk from other aspects of, of weather change climate change uh, are there but the uh, the temperature particularly and that um, is the biggest risk for many of the cities uh, worldwide we have also see a, a change in um, global infrastructure uh, community uh, communications, particularly if you look, the top line is the mobile cell subscription worldwide. You know, it's a, it's almost 100% worldwide. Uh, at least there's one per per person. Now, if you compare to the, the gray line, which started to about 20% and then is dropping, that's continuing to go down. Um, so I think we're going to see a, 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 a continued change in that a move toward wireless even on our our internet connections as well because our phone is nothing more than an internet portal at this point 
We also have infrastructure which tends to be very disconnected uh, and uh, kind of siloed in what they're doing. Our energy systems, including from the renewables, our buildings, the water, uh, our road and infrastructure, storm, rail, all kind of separate pieces there, not really being um, brought together. So we'll talk a little bit more about how some of this will bring that together. Um, other topic that uh, kind of is kind of a buzzword in the industry, it's been out there for a while, but I, I think it's beginning to, to seek or gain recognition, it, digital twin. Uh, it's essentially a virtual or digital replica of a physical product or process or system. And the idea is that it would be a twin of what's going on in the physical world. Uh, early uses I've seen of this already are infrastructure, modeling, uh, transportation planning, uh, cities and urban planning, and trying to see, look at not individual pieces, but the system as a whole. And I think that's where Digital Twin has its most powerful. So there's actually a, a group called a <coughs> Digital Twin Consortium. and it includes a lot of major software players in the industry. You would be surprised to see Microsoft and Amazon in that space. But I think uh, with their interest in cloud, it, it is a, it's a normal interest for them. Of course, all the, the 3D modeling uh, uh, companies are, are in that as well. So it, adding to my other definition, it is synchronized at a, a spe specified frequency and fidelity. So you'll have different levels of a digital twin, a real rough digital twin. You may have very fine detail. And I'll show you, this is actually a um, kind of a rough detail. I think the, the resolution on this is about 20 centimeters. Of course, this is Paris. Uh, this is multiple flows of data to get there. The data from above was uh, collected uh, using a plane. At street level, they can use LIDAR or again use photographs and photogrammetry to be able to to, to be able to grab that or even uh, live cameras. And the more data you have, the, the more uh, resolution you get or the, the finer the resolution. You see, we run into issues where we don't have a lot of uh, ground truth uh, for that particular case. Uh, here's another representation of what a digital twin would be. This was during hurricane season, I think last year. This is a, a broadcaster on the Weather Channel showing what it means when we're talking about three feet of flooding and then on to six feet and showing, you know, cars inundated and then what happens when it's six feet, it's, you know, over your head and things are floating. So that sort of digital representation is, is pretty important. That's sort of possible at the city scale as well. Here is Paris again. This is a, a newer model uh, showing uh, projected flooding on the Seine and where uh, you would see influx of water into the streets uh, in various places. And uh, you can see that. You can also see that when the water drops, where are the opportunities for being able to uh, <coughs> to uh, increase the the uh, wall heights where are the, the areas you see them popping out so that digital twin has a possibility of uh, with that resolution we've got of being a representation and how we could change it kind of as a baseline for us as far as uh, data and analytics um, we've got a lot going on here we've seen you see a lot of the topics tra traditional uh, uh, BI, uh, business information, uh, descriptive analytics, it's really more very structured data, looking at big data sets. Recently, we talked about big data, data lakes, uh, how to know SQL. Uh, it's real-time processing of data. It's very messy, and you're trying to look at trends and derive information from there. Uh, where we're moving at this point is more toward uh, the machine learning side, where we're letting the computer do the computational, find those insights into what's going on. And we're having a lot of uh, uh, things that we couldn't see as analysts or couldn't uh, derive directly, but uh, through artificial intelligence, we can uh, begin to do that. Artificial intelligence generally is just teaching computers to learn and uh, so that they can make 
um, judgments about what information they're receiving and dissimilar, similar to, or in most cases, better than humans because they are able to, to deal with much more data than we could. There are a number of different parts of this. Uh, machine learning is one of the things that's most happening today. It's really um, getting the computer to act on, on data without having to program it specifically, teaching it how to work on that. There's also uh, neural networks where they're automatically learning the features and being able to make judgments or uh, decisions about that. Um, and adversarial, where you've got several neural networks working against each other, learning from each other to, to try to deal with that. Uh, machine learning is nothing more than just math. Is statistics is data. It's not anything special. It's more of a, a, a term of art than anything else. It's not uh, not anything that uh, that you wouldn't understand if you were seeing. As, as the document I referenced there, it's not magic. It, it is just uh, data, statistics, and mathematics. Uh, here's an example. This is Helsinki. Uh, they've created a reality mesh of the city downtown. And one of the things they did was try to use deep learning on this, some of that uh, uh, artificial intelligence to start looking at, can we automatically determine what uh, is a roof or a facade or other pieces there? So their resolution on this, this is third or fourth generation of their digital twin, <clears throat> I think is down to 10 centimeters today. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, AI adoption um, estimates, and this is Wall Street Journal article from a couple of years ago, but they were estimating that uh, um, 20, 30 billion was spent in 2016, and there was startup just in 2017 of almost that amount again. Um, and they think that by 2030, we're at, 20, at 13 trillion dollars. So there's a huge interest in being able to get the data. Data, as I said at the beginning, is like gold. It's what drives a lot of uh, economy and make, helps particularly the big uh, companies make decisions about what's going on. <clears throat> Let's talk a little bit about uh, smart, smart, both technology, cities, and, and buildings. And I pulled a number of quotes here for smart cities. Uh, so it's data and digital technology of, to the goal of improving the quality of life. So that is really the idea behind smart city, using it on existing service, existing urban systems, making it possible to do more with less, and using data and the technology to make better decisions. And I think that best one uh, from Architect Magazine there is using digital technology to solve the timeless problem of cities. So our cities are really still very much individual buildings, that are popped down in the middle of the infrastructure are streets, they don't interact. And that's really the idea of being able to deal with that. From the United Nations, uh, it provide, they, they say it provides a foundation for all of the key themes related to a smart city. Some of the domains, this is McKinsey's view of, of that, uh, looking at mobility, security, healthcare, energy, water, waste, development and housing, and also engagement community. And you see various aspects of that as you're as you're moving forward. Um, there, here's an example. This also from that same report. Uh, the idea that a more efficient, responsive, sustainable city will mean that more people are healthy. There'd be fewer crime incidents. Um, I think, if I remember right, I heard somewhere that if you're in uh, London, that you uh, you're likely within view of uh, more than one, maybe as up to many as six different uh, cameras at any one time. And so the ability to capture crime as it's happening, uh, lower disease burden as we're improving our cities, uh, using the, the smart infrastructure to improve traffic flow, shaving time off daily commute, saving water uh, also, and also emergency uh, response times being faster. So you see all the interconnectedness there, and I'll, we'll talk more about that in a bit. So aspects of uh, what they think could be done, you know, environmental quality, reducing greenhouse gas emissions, waste, uh, water, social connectedness and civic 
participation, I think may be one of the easiest things. We give, our cities will give our uh, people uh, an app to be able to say, you know, this light is out on this street. Uh, something that the city might not notice or, or not have in their regular rounds for a while. Uh, being able to have them connected and being able to, to interact with each other in their local government. Uh, increasing jobs to some extent, decreasing cost of living, safety, and I think that's probably uh, one of the key things. Transportation and uh, that infrastructure, I think, is going to see it earlier than anything else. And then disease burden by improving the environmental quality and all the other aspects, making people healthier, and then uh, increasing commute time. Well, of course, <laughs> this past year and a bit, our commute times have been quite short. And uh, we're, it's going to be interesting to watch how many organizations go back to being in person fully. I, I think there's going to be more uh, attention to doing some interaction uh, together in our offices, but uh, many people likely will stay remote. Uh, my own company, which we're spread in 80 countries around the world, um, for, fully 40% of the company already worked from home. So for us, it was not a big transition. And our company has said that no one has to go back into the office ever. If they may need to for meetings, but for the most part, we have been virtual for the last uh, 15 months. And so that's a, a you know kind of a, a real change. But then we were already very virtual to begin with. Uh, smart city technology bases. If you look at uh, Europe, the uh, Nordic. Uh, Stockholm, Amsterdam, Copenhagen, even Barcelona and Helsinki are kind of in that range, the top tier. Uh, U.S., New York, San Francisco, Chicago, Seattle, uh, there. Asia Pacific, Singapore, Seoul, Shanghai, Melbourne, Hong Kong, not surprising any of the top people or top groups. So they're already looking at the opportunities. How can they improve some of this? Uh, some of the forecast benefits, this is from Microsoft. Microsoft has a whole team working on um, looking at uh, digital living and, and also uh, smart cities, which is you know, kind of interesting for what's essentially being seen as a desktop group. But looking at urban uh, ability, uh, looking toll, parking management, traffic, transit optimization, improving that based on information, not just putting everything on a timer like they are now. Uh, smarter infrastructure, using citizen reporting, service management systems, public safety. So we've got improved safety reporting and evidence collection, digital hearing on speeding tickets. Uh, you know, in the U.S., courts have been meeting digitally. And so being able to accelerate uh, the time of uh, trying to make sure that uh, crime is reported and also um, the trials are, are expedited uh, can be uh, done there. Improve citizen social care. I think this is where a lot of cities are going to focus initially. Streamlining application, government interaction. So if you're trying to get uh, planning permission to uh, do an addition to your house or you need to build a new building, getting that digit digitalized to, to be able to, to move quickly will be really important. It'll mean more money both for you to get a building up uh, faster but also it uh, would be for the government if they're trying to collect taxes, improve government services, improve social care as well. Um, <clears throat> this is uh, anatomies of a, a smart city. Starting on the left, the world is now urban, uh, urbanized. By 2008, over half the world population were living in cities. By 2040, it's predicted to be 65%. It's gonna be interesting to see that change though, because in the US with the pandemic, we saw a kind of a outflow of people from all the large cities. In fact, in California, more people left California for the first time in its history than uh, moved in. So California is actually shrinking a little bit. And that's partly a push away from the large cities to where it's more uh, possible to have a, you know, a lifestyle where you have um, time for your family. You're not doing the commuting if you're uh, doing a, a work from home situation. Uh, Tokyo, uh, largest city being uh, 36 million people. If it were a country, it says it would rank 35th in population size. So it's a huge interaction there. 29 uh, additional five uh, megacities in, uh, in Asia, 
in, two in Latin America and one in Africa. <coughs> so uh, number of cities with more than 1 million people um, by uh, 2011 was 500 worldwide. So there's a lot, of, that's a large proportion of it. I remember being in China and they had a whole training uh, center for uh, their city mayors and the, uh, um, the administrative staff that came on board in Beijing to be able to help them because there were so many that were growing to the size they needed help in, in understanding how to manage and doing that. Uh, as far as developing cities, the uh, most of the growth is going to occur in the in kind of the, that shadow area, the informal settlements. Um, a lot of that one billion that uh, that live in in poor conditions now is expected to to grow to two billion by uh, 2030. Uh, I think the pandemic's probably making that worse in some cases. Um, economic influence: the top urban centers are 60 percent of our uh, GDP. So that means all the money is being made there. All the all the economic activity is happening in the cities, and at the same time they have a larger environmental impact, 60 to 80% of the energy needs. So we have to, to, to really uh, deal with that. The other thing, looking at the need, we've got sensors, networks, and engagement. So we've got, again, same sort of things we've looked at, environment, safety, transportation, utilities, and buildings, all as part of that system. You see them interacting here, and I think that's kind of important. Um, another view of a smart city in a box. Um, Again, those same topics, but people looking at uh, apps to be able to interact uh, with their government or with the services they're dealing with, smart homes, smart toilets, um, uh, security, facial recognition, CCTV, behavior analytics, fire, fire and smoke detection, uh, efficiency, lighting, uh, predictive lift maintenance and predictive maintenance in general, uh, traffic monitoring and then energy, water, and climate uh, management. As far as some of this, um, this shows a view from where smart manufacturing is. If you stop, start top right, industry 4.0, beginning to move to item two, digitization, deepening relationships, focusing on people and culture, and then where we are now is kind of the five and six, data analytics, uh, transforming that enterprise-wide analytics, and it requires a significant change in how people are dealing with that. So accelerating globalization, which uh, it, it, it has been kind of shown as kind of a problem. Our, our uh, <clears throat> supply chain has been somewhat difficult of late. I, I know that um, we had a disruption here in the US just on Friday of uh, one of the major gas pipelines and already on the East Coast, there are a number of states that, where there's no uh, petrol for uh, half the, the stations uh, to supply. And it was that quick of a change. So our supply chain has been just in time, and that's going to continue. But it also makes it tends to make it fragile. Um, here, another view of global industry, being able to look at um, predictive maintenance, real-time monitoring, predictive quality, looking at process and mining that information and location-based solutions, dealing with something very specific to that. And you see the kind of the different, as you move from left to right, from statistical modeling, machine learning, simulation, on to optimization there and various types of data related to that. Let's see. So uh, getting close, internet of everything. I wanna, uh, oops, sorry. <clears throat> 5G has really been seen as the, the means of getting there. 5G is uh, beginning to hit uh, our mobile phones and is uh, seen as the possibility of being able to connect things without wires, whether it's within buildings or even our uh, street lights and other things going on out there. But it, the last sentence is really the key thing. It's not so much the, the speed that the advantage of it. Yes, you get the speed advantage, but it's a low latency. And what I mean by that is the response rate. So that when you put out a request, things pop up 
immediately. It's not something you have to wait. It gets sent out, it goes through the network and comes back. We're going to get instantaneous response. <coughs> um, I, I wound up, my uh, mobile phone died last fall and I had a 4G phone moved to a 5G. I'm getting faster data rates on my 5G than I get through my home network. And so that possible, but I also get things that are instantaneous in my hand. So I've just about turned off the Wi-Fi on my phone because I'm getting so much better. So that capability to be able to do real-time interaction with devices is what makes 5G uh, interesting for all the pieces we're going to do. Um, I'm not. I'm going to go through this very quickly, but the chart really just shows that if you look at 1992 on the right-hand chart. Uh, about a million devices were on the internet, just a million. And so even at, by 2003, a full decade later, it was only uh, 500 million. But by about a decade ago, with the Internet of Things coming online, we're now seeing billions of devices where it was predicted we were going to have 50 billion devices uh, interconnected uh, on the Internet of Things uh, by this past year. Um, we'll see whether we get there. Uh, but one of the big things about this is security and how do we increasingly ensure that our devices and our information are secure because we see hacks all the time into databases and people being able to get there and 90 percent of people just don't think our devices are secure enough and so that's important if we're going to be able to trust that information uh you know losing control of it losing access to our our uh, logins, etc., uh, very uh, difficult to deal with, and it, it's going to be a challenge for us. It, in some respects, I think IoT is a bit ahead of the security issue. How are we going to do that? Just because we can doesn't mean we should without being able to ensure uh, security. That cybersecurity has got to be Im important. There again, we see a similar sort of chart: 50 billion devices on there. Um, so that we're the the risks are getting worse uh, as the value of the data gets to be more. Uh, there's a, a greater um, opportunity for hackers to to be able to deal with that and and stability. I mean, this gas pipeline that was shut down by a ransomware attack. Uh, so there's there's you know it, it's not hard to to be able to see that our our supply chain. We've got to harden our security and make sure that it, it is uh, impossible or exceedingly difficult to, to hack into. It's already changing design and operation, uh, collecting uh, information to analyze how spaces are used and being able to share that among data. This was from an article uh, just over two years ago. Uh, so data is driving decision making there. Uh, here's an example, and why isn't it running? Here we go. This is a, a, a BIM model being has been converted into a digital twin. It's for um, ASHRAE's, uh, not ASHRAE, sorry, Microsoft's uh, Southeast Asia headquarters in Singapore. And um, they've already done the interconnections with all the wireless data. So they're able to, for any space, go in and take a look at temperature, what happened over the day, uh, and are able to, to look at that from the wireless data. Uh, sensor, sensor point, excuse me. Uh, they also can look at uh, occupancy, not not trying to keep tabs on people, but if their occupancy rate is, is pretty low, and this was pulling data real time, uh, they are able to see when the space is occupied, when it's not, and being able to, to look at what the options are. You know, if it's percent occupied, it's only 8.7%. Do we really need a, a, a particular um, space for that? Is it something we could do hot desking with? Similarly, they can begin to look at the data in real time over over the days. And I know this is not uh, this is something we've been able to do with our building management systems, but this was done with a wireless system collecting through two different systems. No, and let's move on. Um, <clears throat> So wireless is really the key thing here, being able to have the data collected, being able to, to look at interesting. This was a, a company I found kind of interesting where they had a number of different things going on, uh, workplace ID batches, action alert activity, motion sensors, people counting, 
occupancy presence sensors and, and dynamic uh, safety signage as well, being able to work with all that uh, uh, wirelessly. Uh, it's already changing um, construction in the IoT in a larger sense. We've got the drones you see picture here. This was from the Guardian uh, a year or so ago of uh, Notre Dame. Um, there's bridges that now it, uh, there's software out there. You take a drone out there, create a model, and you can automatically identify, identify through machine learning uh, potential issues such as cracks and and other um, infrastructure issues. So it also, that improves worker safety. You don't have people dangling off bridges to go look at things. 3D modeling and precision measurement. You can get to where you're at uh, a resolution of a couple centimeters uh, if you're willing to you know, put in the, the effort to collect the model. It's, it's very doable now and you can measure within a digital twin. Uh, asset tracking as well, predict, predictive maintenance, augmented reality, see the guys there you know, looking because then they're looking at the bridge but also looking at the information provided by the machine learning to be able to deal with that. And then construction integrated man, uh, manufacturing, which we've seen already, uh, but that ability to, to uh, uh, integrate the, um, I'm sorry, that should say it says construction, but it should say computer integrated manufacturing. Uh, so that's really a big change there. Uh, here's an example. I talked about data. This is city of Philadelphia. Uh, the Pope was coming to Philadelphia in uh, 2005, and um, they needed a 3D model for security purposes. And this was, and you can see some of the security barriers that have been put in place there. But this is because the model is 3D, is accurate, they can bring it into a BIM model, add information to it, uh, et cetera, so the, that data is possible. But I talked about benchmarking data, that same data set then can be used to identify outliers and to have other information at your fingertips. Uh, this data is interactive, this is just showing a fly through, uh, looking at uh, the worst case scenarios for both energy and water in uh, showing up as red. Um, but the ability to start looking at, at some of that data uh, in a holistic view is really important. Um, we, we saw the flood model of Paris, similar one uh, for Helsinki. They, they did their own model, uh, trying to look at the issues of when we're going to see, uh, <coughs> excuse me, uh, coastal water rise, uh, sea, sea level rise, we're gonna have uh, challenges and where they're gonna see it within their city. So they can begin to plan for either raising barriers or changing their infrastructure. Uh, Helsinki is kind of an interesting case. They've been working on this idea of digital twin and 3D modeling for a while. They, uh, this is from their website. Um, the utilization cases, the use cases, what are they thinking about? Smart carbon, smart city services, web, business, city marketing, tourism, events, city planning, traffic and transportation, microclimate, et cetera, all the way down rescue and safety. Things that are possible they could use and then the data that they're looking to get. And if you look at the green dots, that's what they're able to do today. So they know there are lots of things they could do with a full digital implementation, but they're, they're moving forward with that. So could the future be this interconnected system where we're, we are getting response, where we're uh, using our artificial intelligence to help improve the systems? I think we can. I think we're gonna get that connected infrastructure as we're moving so that we have at the buildings level, uh, all that at our renewables and the infrastructure level, we'll have that as well and be able to, to talk and interact with each other. And I'm going the wrong way. Thank you. Uh, the height curve is kind of an interesting thing. If you go to the very top of the curve, uh, digital twin right now, smart workspace, that's all in the peak of inflated expectations. It is very much in the height curve. If you go further on, you'll see IoT platform, connected home, mixed realities moving into the trough of disillusionment, augmented realities there. So we have a lot of things that are uh, moving toward getting there, but we're not, there, there's a lot right now that is 
um, more words than the reality. And if you kind of follow up from the bottom in the first area, uh, 5G is up in there as well. So I think we're going to see a lot of change, but there's going to be some backwards movement. Well, we really can't do this with it, but we can do that. So in summary, our 3D digital models or digital twins will make it easier to, to understand and and manage our buildings, communities, infrastructure, uh, interactions with the environment. It's not just a, a static BIM model as something that will be living, that can uh, grow and, uh, and change with time as things change. Um, for example, in that Helsinki case, they're able to, if they have a, a new building built, the BIM model can be uh, put within that as well. So they've got more detail on, on individual buildings. Sensors are uh, becoming ubiquitous, uh, you know, in the past in a building, one of the reasons we didn't put all the sensors in was just the sheer cost of providing wiring of that back to the central system. Now with wireless, they're they're going, they're becoming cheap and easy to use. Security, privacy, data ownership are really uh, key issues, and I, I don't think we've used, uh, we've solved that yet. I think as you know, continue to see the hacks that we've seen, uh, it, it's a problem we're going to continue to, to deal with for the for the near term until we find new methods. With 5G, we've got uh, new data connectedness that wouldn't have been possible before. Uh, and that's really what's going to enable our smart cities. Anything that we now measure locally can uh, will be connected. So our smart cities will lead to the Internet of Things to our, our I mean, our smart buildings uh, will lead to the smart cities. The, those individual items together will create that, that smart city. The data analytics uh, from the business intelligence to the ma machine learning into true AI, uh, we can find trends, learn information from data that's not visible in any other way. It's not something you can get by just doing a, a, a spreadsheet sort and, and being able to mine the data there. The, these uh, systems are, are quite uh, good at, at looking at data and, and finding what's going on. And as I've said, much of it's hype. Uh, watch for it. Uh, I think it, it's important that you understand that it's coming, and but look for the opportunities within it as well. I think the the, the sensors and 5G, that's going to happen. Um, the industry is pushing there to be able to have low-cost sensors that are easy to deploy is really important and that particularly in the building sector where uh, the cost of putting a wired sensor in it is quite high. So, uh, last I want to talk about um, metrics. Most of my career I've had to focus on these. I was trying to reduce energy, reduce peak demand, and reduce capital cost if possible or minimize it and reduce operating cost. But in what I've learned is that there are many other things that if we don't cover them, we don't look at them, we're going to have issues. Water, uh, particularly in the U.S., uh, where we've had drought and in, in, uh, <clears throat> in the Southwest for a number of years, and so water is scarce. We need to be thinking about it. Indoor environmental quality that came to the forefront with the pandemic, uh, when it became clear that this wasn't a this was transmitted primarily by aerosols, not by surface contact. Uh, and carbon. As we move to uh, decarbonizing the world, we need to really think of what the impacts of everything we're doing as far as design are considering. But one of the things I learned uh, when I was Department of Energy was that we need to look at the business model for the players. I worked very early with uh, Walmart and Target and some of the, the big multinational um, retail groups. And understanding what their business model was because we needed to have information that would support them not just information that we were uh, provided uh, so of course retail is mostly about sales per square meter uh, if it's a school it's about students you know can i translate the information can i translate that into to dollars per student saved or dollars per student cost or impact uh, if it's a, a hotel motel situation, it's about occupied room. What's my revenue per occupied room? So don't talk to me about per square meter. Talk to me about what is a typical room? How much am I going to save? Or what, what is the impact at that level? Because that's how they operate. 
what the more fun ones I've seen are uh, breweries and wineries that are produce, uh, talking about their carbon uh, savings that are reducing their carbon footprint in terms of per barrel of beer. Uh, so, you know, that's their metric. That's, you know, how many barrels of beer they sell dictates income. And the same is true for wine. So understanding that is important. Giving information there uh, that's in their terms, not so much in engineering terms or, or normalized terms. So with that, I'll uh, say thank you and uh, turn it over for questions. Thanks very much, Drew. Um, given that we're, we've just run to the run to the hour, yeah. I think we might uh, skip over the questions. But I'm, I'd welcome if anyone does want to submit something, um, and we haven't, you know, thankfully I don't think we've got anything coming through at the moment. So um, I may just switch to some closing announcements. Um, but again, thanks very much, Drew, for a really interesting presentation that I think covered a lot of topical issues. Um, I had a, a couple of things myself. I'm sure we'll. Um, I'll hopefully be able to invite you back in person and, and have a, a link to your discussion when you're when you're able to visit us again. Um, Daniel, let, let, me, just, let me just say, you've got my email address there. Um, if you want to contact me, if something occurs to you later, please do so. Thanks very much, Drew. Um, so I'm just going to switch back to myself for a few brief closing announcements. Okay. Um, so just very quickly, um, again, um, this is the, uh, the, the current Ashray Ireland board. We're, uh, our AGM is coming up next month, and we're always looking for, for volunteers that are interested in, in joining us. So if you are interested in participating, uh, please feel free to, to contact myself or anyone else on the, on the Ashray board. Um, as always, uh, you can you can stay in touch with us uh, using our mailing list or subscribing to us on social media. Uh, links are provided on the slide. And again, thanks again to all of our sponsors and supporters for um, your ongoing support, which which makes all of these these events and activities possible. Um, and finally, just a, a big word of, of thanks to to Drew for for joining us. And hopefully, Drew will be able to, as I said, invite you back in, in person to to come to Dublin again sometime soon. Um, okay, we'll uh, end it there and uh, thanks everyone for joining today. Uh, our next event is um, coming up in, let's check the, the calendar in, in, a, in a week or two. Um, so hopefully we'll look forward to seeing you then. Thanks very much, everyone.